Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Jacoby, and I'm a professor in the Department of Religious Studies at Northwestern University. I'd like to welcome you to the first event of this year of the Kent State Foundation Buddhist Studies Lecture Series at Northwestern University. This lecture series was founded last year in 2020 with the generous support of the Kent State Foundation. Its objectives are to promote Buddhist studies in its many forms by inviting a range of speakers whose research specializes in different aspects of the field, including textual scholarship as well as ethnography, modern as well as historical time periods, and a wide variety of cultural, linguistic, and geographical locations, including Buddhist heartlands in Asia, as well as North America and beyond. Our core lecture series community consists of doctoral students in Buddhist studies funded by the Kensei Foundation, who are based in universities around the world, currently including McMaster University, Leiden University, the University of Edinburgh, the University of Arizona, University of Sydney, UC Berkeley, University of Naples, L'Orientale in Italy, and last but not least, Northwestern University. The lecture series aims to foster intellectual community and opportunities for collaboration and dialogue among its graduate student and faculty members and our invited speakers. This is our first hybrid event, so hopefully it will work. Um, today, we are gathered here at Northwestern University and online in a webinar. Last year, our events were all on Zoom due to the pandemic, and in the future, we plan to have more hybrid events like this one that will be available to the public. Today, I'm so delighted to welcome Dr. Jan Ronis, Executive Director of the Buddhist Digital Resource Center. Dr. Ronis received his MA and PhD degrees from the University of Virginia, where he researched the history of the Tibetan Kingdom of Dege in the 17th and 18th centuries, and particularly the local Nyingma monasteries. Dr. Ronis's dissertation focused on Katok Monastery and is titled Celibacy, Revelations, and Reincarnated Lamas, Contestation and Synthesis in the Growth of Monasticism at Katok Monastery from the 17th through 19th centuries. He's no armchair scholar. I can attest to the extensive time he spent at Katok and in the Kham region as our paths crossed there. Um, actually, our paths more than crossed, um, as Jan was my former housemate during our graduate school years at UVA. Um, this means that I could tell you pretty much anything about <laughs> Dr. Jan Ronis, uh, but for now, I will stick to his significant contributions to Buddhist studies. Dr. Ronis began working at what was then called TB TBRC in 2005 as a scholar in residence, where he worked closely with TBRC's founder, E. Jean Smith, the renowned bibliographer of Tibetan texts. After completing his position as Shinjo Ito postdoc in Buddhist studies at UC Berkeley and teaching there for some time afterwards, he rejoined BDRC, this time as its executive director. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jan Ronis. Thank you, Sarah, for the invitation and for the um, kind uh, introduction to the talk today. Um, this is your first uh, hybrid event here at Northwestern and also mine. Just as I was uh, getting pretty comfortable with Zoom exclusive events, now we're going back to speaking in person. So let's see uh, how it goes. But it seems like the technology is working uh, so far. So just uh, let me know through hand gestures or, or whatnot if um, something starts to, to go awry. But uh, it's lovely to be here today and to give a talk um, about the preservation of Buddhist texts and uh, the role of, of BDRC in some of the international efforts. Uh, but first, I wanted to thank uh, Sarah, my, my dear friend, for inviting me. Like she said, we were roommates um, for, for a long time during our, our graduate school years. Um, we also share a birthday, more or less. We were born just um, six days apart, same year. 
Um, uh, in fact, we traveled to Tibet together um, during the summer of our 30th year. Um, and so that was fun. I won't tell you which year that is, so then you can uh, do the math and, and figure out our ages. But uh, we did that. But a, a more important milestone that we shared together was uh, traveling um, across the pond to Oxford for our first International Association of Tibetan Studies conference. That was in, in 2003. That was a big deal for us. We were, you know, lowly uh, and poor graduate students that were really, you know, out of our league going to a huge international conference. We knew almost no one there and certainly none of the Europeans. But uh, it uh, was a pivotal moment for both of us um, uh, personally. But you can, you can hear those stories another time. Anyways, thanks so much for inviting me here. I'm really happy to have this opportunity to um, talk about the work of the organization that I belong to. Um, and thanks also to the Kensei Foundation, another interesting um, coincidence and connection is that um, Kensei Foundation is um, BDRC's you know, stalwart supporter from the beginning. And uh, till today, we've you know, really relied upon their, their generosity and guidance, as I'll explain um, in a little bit. The name of the talk today is Indra's, Indra's Net for the Information Age. Um, that was the you know, original proposed title. I'm going to introduce Indra's Net at the end of the talk. So for now, let's just bracket that. If you don't know what it means, um, don't worry. Uh, I'm, I'm going to explain it once it becomes relevant. Uh, but for the first 30 minutes or so, I'll be um, talking about some issues that don't uh, necessitate understanding you know, ancient Indian metaphors. All right. Um, so let me go ahead. One moment, please. It does work. Great. OK. Um, because we have a, a hybrid and a mixed audience, I, just, I wasn't sure what, what people's um, levels of uh, Buddhist knowledge would be. So forgive me if, if the first few minutes are a little bit remedial. Um, so Buddhism you know, can be considered a religion of the book, so to speak. Um, and we're here to talk about books. So um, how is it that books are relevant to Buddhist teachings and, and relig religiosity and the sustainability of Buddhist culture today? So um, perhaps I don't need to say too much about the life of the Buddha, but for those uh, people out there um, who are somewhat beginners, I'll just remind you that Buddha lived in the Gangetic River Plain in the 6th to 5th centuries BCE. Um, and he had a 40 year long uh, traveling teaching career that you know, more or less was uh, within the bounds of that red box there on the map. Um, and so the Buddhists revere the teachings of the Buddha. His teachings are called Dharma, a word that in this context means truth, standard, law. The Dharma originated as an oral tradition for many generations, the leading monks were those who were highly talented in memorization and recitation of the Dharma scriptures. Today, we are here to talk um, about Buddhist texts. So let's leave behind the oral tradition and just jump ahead to the advent of written scriptures in the Buddhist tradition. Based on the stories preserved by the tradition itself and archeological evidence, at the turn of the first millennia, some Buddhists began to transcribe the oral teachings and also to compose born textual Dharma teachings. The earliest reference in Buddhist texts of the scriptures being committed to writing occurs in a Sinhalese chronicle in which it is stated that during the reign of Varagamani Abhaya, who reigned between 29 and 17 BCE, um, some monks who remembered the canon, the entire canon, wrote it down, apparently fearing that otherwise it might be lost as a result of war, famine, or infighting among monasteries. Because of the warm and wet climate in Sri Lanka, we do not have any remnants of texts from this time, but there is no reason to doubt this account. So this is the sort of official uh, Buddhist explanation, you can say, for uh, the transition from a purely oral tradition to um, a mixed oral and written uh, tradition it had to do with you know, dealing with, it was an extreme measure to extreme circumstances. Um, all right, and then in the last couple of decades, 
a considerable amount of legible fragments of 2,000 year old texts have been uncovered in Afghanistan and Pakistan. This region was at one time fervently Buddhist, uh, as we all know from the Bamiyan Buddhas. Most of the text fragments from Gandhara, oh, and this region uh, is known as, was known as Gandhara at this time. Most of the text fragments from Gandhara are written on birch bark. Birch bark manuscripts were rectangular and usually rolled up as scrolls. The language of these texts was Gandhari, which is distantly related to Sanskrit, well known as the holy language of India. While birch bark was common on the Himalayan fringe of South Asia, in the heartland of the South Asian continent and across Southeast Asia, the dominant media for sacred texts was inscribed palm leaves. And here are some examples of uh, birch bark manuscripts. Um, so here's a kind of a recompilation of uh, fragments that formerly belonged to one scroll, and they were found in, in recent decades stored in clay pots. The archaeology of this is fascinating. Um, and for those who wish to learn more, I think the best source is uh, uh, Solomon's book, um, The Buddhist Teachings of Gandhara, Ancient Gandhara from Wisdom Publications. All right, but the more common uh, form of Buddhist, uh, uh, what would you say, manuscript technologies in South and Southeast Asia was the palm leaf manuscript. And so palm leaf manuscripts. Um, were written on leaves that had been dried and cut into uniform strips. Palm leaf manuscripts were inscribed with a metal stylus and subsequently blackened with ink to make the letters readable. So they would dry out um, pages, folia of palm leaves, inscribe with a sharp stylus the, the writing, um, but it was still not very legible at that point. All you saw were scrapes on uh, a dried piece of leaf. Uh, the way that you could sort of um, reveal the inscribed writing was to sprinkle ink across it, wipe the uh, piece of uh, palm leaf, and um, the ink that wasn't in the grooves made by the stylus would be swept away, and then the letters that had been inscribed would be quite clear in black ink. Um, and it wouldn't stay there forever, you know, every generation. They would need to be, you know, wiped clean with water and then re-inked if they were to be read again. When finished, the leaves were stacked and strung together through one or two holes punched through them and finally stored between two wooden boards. Um, and so here we see uh, palm leaves stacked and tied together with strings. So holes were, were bored through the pages and then they were not only held together by being sandwiched between boards, but individual fascicles or bundles that were united by a common being a, belonging to a common text or having a common uh, theme would also be tied together with uh, colorful strings. Other media used for writing Buddhist texts include paper, cloth, silk, vellum, and occasionally plates made from metals such as copper, silver, and gold. And now let's move on to paper manuscripts. Um, and so some of these media permitted manuscript formats, such as works that were folded together, like an accordion. Um, accordion fold is called a concertina or leporello. Um, and the codex or the book form is less common, but still attested. And so here we see another um, concertina or accordion fold text. And so we can see that it allows for it work to be opened up and so there can be large large images and the text can be um, sort of formatted in in ways that can't be done if you're using just a rectangular uh, palm leaf all right and more of these uh, leporellos digitized by by ddrc in this talk um, we are using manuscript loosely to mean old texts in traditional formats uh, so far, all of the types mentioned have been manuscripts in that they were handwritten. But if you will permit me, um, we will include printed books in this category of manuscripts. Um, Buddhists in East Asia were on the vanguard of printing technologies worldwide. The earliest surviving datable, complete printed book in the entire world is a copy of the Diamond Sutra, 
uh, which is held uh, by the British Library dating to the ninth century. The chief form of printing in China, Tibet, Mongolia, Japan, and Korea was xylography, woodblock printing. Xylography involves uh, carving the text and images in reverse, inking the boards, and then pressing paper against the woodblocks to print them. Even after woodblock printing became widely adopted, manuscripts were still produced in vast quantities. So this is an example of a printed book, xylograph, and here we see that the tradition is uh, still alive in, in some regions of Tibet and elsewhere. This is a, a craftsman who is employed full time as a carver of, of woodblock prints, and here's a fresh set uh, being dried out in the sun after uh, having been carved and, and edited. And then the process involves, uh, like I mentioned before, inking the board, laying a piece of paper across it, and then rubbing it. So here's an old monk who's been doing it for decades at Dzogchen Monastery in Eastern Tibet. All right, so now I'd like, with that introduction um, behind us, now I'd like to uh, present um, and discuss the conditions and use of pre-modern Buddhist handwritten and printed books in the living Buddhist communities of today. The archeological finds of ancient text fragments from long lost temples are very exciting and unmistakably important for Buddhist studies. But I believe we're here today to talk about the preservation efforts and successes of archives with active communities of use. At this point, I could uh, probably make some comparisons with um, the role of manuscripts in other cultural regions um, of the present day, but I don't want to embarrass myself by citing incorrect numbers. So suffice it to say that many present day Buddhist countries have remarkably large numbers of old manuscripts that are still housed and utilized in traditional ways. That is to say that Buddhist manuscripts are still a commonplace in the life and culture of the religion. A researcher interested in um, Buddhist manuscripts, say a, a PhD student here at, at Northwestern University, um, would likely go directly to a monastery or temple in rural Asia to find their primary materials, not to a state library or university, which might be the case, say, if you were interested in Irish manuscripts, you would probably go to you know, Trinity College, something like that. But in, in uh, say, Tibetan Buddhism, you would go to a, a monastery where you could find them still uh, being used and housed in, in a somewhat traditional manner. Um, so uh, the manuscripts are still highly prized by the communities. The traditional owners of the manuscripts usually still have possession of them, and they are still studied, venerated, used for ritual purposes, and so on. In some cases, new manuscripts and even new xylographs are being produced in the 21st century, as we just saw a moment ago. Not only are the manuscripts still central to many Buddhist traditions, but there are a lot of them. Hundreds of thousands of volumes are still extant. So again, I, I don't want to make comparisons, but this is a, um, an impressive number uh, by any count. Hundreds of thousands of extant, um, somewhat pretty well-preserved manuscripts in uh, Buddhist uh, communities around Asia. Now, all of that being said, the last 150 to 200 years have been challenging for most Buddhist communities. Colonialism, war, persecution, exile, capitalism, changing values, climate change, epidemics, and other threats from within and without have led to much human misery and loss of tangible and intangible Buddhist culture. Some of the forces listed above have devastated Buddhist communities, and others are uh, still having a pernicious, pernicious effect on cultural sustainability. Buddhists have shown great resiliency and adaptability throughout history, and the recent times are no different. Though some of the threats, such as persecutions by unstoppable forces, have been tragically devastating. So I chose this image you know, to illustrate Buddhist manuscripts today. You see that there are a lot, different kinds, and in um, various shapes. By shapes, I mean conditions. Some look a little ragged, others are, are well-preserved, some are new, some are old. This is uh, what we're going to find as we continue the lecture. All right, so cultural practices and ideologies are malleable, 
and Buddhists have reworked their traditions in many ingenious ways to stay meaningful and relevant. The manuscript tradition is particularly challenged, however. Manuscripts need a lot of space. They are made of impermanent materials and cannot be easily repaired. And sometimes they are targeted by adversaries of the Dharma. The threats to manuscripts are numerous, fire, flood, and pests, all of which are exacerbated by global climate change. Additional threats include theft or sale by people in the art and tourist markets, full frontal destruction during war, and the neglect that comes about because of an inability to finance their care, changing values in society, breakdowns in a cultural ecosystem, and so on. So while it's uh, very common to find libraries that are um, very well uh, populated by manuscripts that are cared for and, and cataloged, um, it's also the case that even in places that have escaped some of the problems I just mentioned, war, persecution, exile, and, and so forth, um, over the centuries, manuscripts have been uh, damaged because of floods or, or fires. Um, or just neglect. And so there are many places in the, in the Himalayas, in Mongolia, in China, certainly in Southeast Asia, where it's not uncommon in a temple to find stacks of uh, pages that have been rescued from complete destruction, but are still in need of, of care. And so I, again, I'll just point out that this is not a picture from a, a war-torn area. This is a picture, I think, from, from somewhere like Ladakh. Um, and I must acknowledge that these two uh, photographs were shared by me with the Vienna Project of Manuscript Preservation, uh, RKTS, the Resources for Congo Tango Studies, a very close partner of, of BDRC. So, um, you know, it's just inevitable that, that at times many manuscripts will, will fall into disarray like this. So, um, if you don't think I was giving just a Pollyanna um, description of things, um, there are real, real challenges. Um, and here are some palm leaf manuscripts from Southeast Asia. Again, these were not you know, targeted by any particular uh, army or, or group that had it out for uh, Buddhist manuscripts. It's just they have been sort of neglected and now they're being you know, gathered together in boxes and eventually someone will go through and try to recompile the text that still have a, a significant number of pages left. And um, you know, I would be giving an incomplete picture if I didn't say that um, certainly there are um, a lot of efforts on the ground to uh, go through the pages, uh, save the ones that, that can be saved, uh, do conservation work, and try to recompile the individual volumes and uh, recompile entire collections when, when possible. These pictures were also shared by me, uh, shared with me by the uh, Vienna, Vienna group. All right, but as for the um, destructive forces that have led to so much um, misery and also uh, loss of Buddhist culture, including manuscript traditions. Vesna Wallace, um, professor of uh, Tibetan and, and Mongolian Buddhism at UC Santa Barbara says, quote, the systematic and large scale destruction of Buddhist texts during the communist purges in Mongolia was a great blow to the preservation of Buddhist manuscripts. As happened in other communist totalitarian regimes, the first victims of the repression of religious expression in Mongolia were religious texts." End quote. And so what she says about communist purges in USSR in controlled outer Mongolia or Republic of Mongolia also applies to uh, the People's Republic of China. Now, I'll, I'll go back to that. Um, all right, and then speaking of Southeast Asia, um, Cambodia suffered one of the most extreme cases of manuscript loss in, 20th century, in the 20th century. Um, scholar Trent Walker gives this thumbnail sketch of the situation, quote, very few traditional manuscripts of any format survive today in Cambodia. By one scholar's estimates, nearly 98% of such materials were lost in the tumultuous period between 1970 and 1990. Some were certainly lost to willful destruction at the hands of the Khmer Rouge, 1975 to 1979, 
Others were scattered or simply succumbed to the elements. Two decades of warfare often made proper storage of manuscripts impossible, and Cambodia's climate is hardly conducive to the longevity of organic fibers. Now, Dr. Walker, Trent Walker, is a specialist of um, the accordion fold texts, the concertinas or leporellos. Um, and uh, so about his particular specialty in Cambodia, he reports, I am only aware of a few hundred examples of leporellos that survived the tumultuous last 50 years. This is partially due to the fragility of traditional bark paper leporellos. So again, he uh, cites a, a very you know, experienced, incredible scholar that perhaps 98% of Mongolian manuscripts were destroyed over um, only a 30 year period. Um, and uh, so much of it was due to the war, but also some of these materials simply um, you know, don't last a very long time given what they're made of and the climate in which they, they you know, find their, their existence. Um, the situation is uh, somewhat uh, you know, further challenged in Southeast Asia because um, the scribal tradition um, is also relatively weak these days. So even if there was an interest in producing more uh, palm leaf manuscripts, um, the living tradition of, of scribe craftspeople um, just isn't very strong. And so uh, while there's still a lot of palm leaves that, that could be utilized, um, there are not so many people that would know how to create a, a traditional palm leaf manuscript. All right, so the um, loss is devastating. So what do we lose when these manuscripts, or what is lost? I shouldn't say we, but what is lost when these manuscripts are are destroyed or, or damaged or disappear, right? The loss is, is devastating. Scriptures, textual history, medical knowledge, the sciences, literature, the visual arts, voices otherwise lost to the void, the names of people great and humble, you know, all of it will, will disappear if it's only recorded in, in manuscripts. Or if the scholars who uh, you know, sort of uh, represent the tradition don't have these, these manuscripts to jog their memories or to learn learn further. Uh, the loss is most acute for the communities who created, sustained, and relied upon these texts and their contents, but it's also a great loss for the Dharma worldwide and the global humanities. I think we, we would all agree about that. So the um, local efforts have been tremendous. From small villages to national centers of learning, there have been successful undertakings to rescue texts from unsafe conditions, recompile volumes whose whose pages have been scattered, catalog collections, and most importantly, train new generations in the literary languages and specialized knowledges of the textual cultures. Desktop publishing um, has also been hugely beneficial to these preservation efforts. In Tibetan communities, for instance, hundreds of volumes of formerly rare or inaccessible texts have been keyed into a computer, typeset, and printed in either the traditional um, book format or as modern paperbacks. And so here we see some editor, well, editor monks um, who are going over uh, the galleys of a, a, a manuscript that was inputted, maybe even by these monks here on the left, um, and will eventually be published as a, as a book. And here's an example of um, a, a result of the Tibetans' very skillful use of desktop publishing to keep uh, the Dharma and, and their traditions alive. So it's important. Uh, and then mechanical reproduction, religion in the age of mechanical, mechanical reproduction means that um, people and monasteries of means can um, easily rebuild their, their libraries by buying, um, you know, hundreds or thousands of volumes of text that have been uh, published using uh, mechanical means. But here we're, we're talking about manuscripts. And so not all manuscripts can receive this treatment, it being inputted, edited by groups of monks, published, made widely accessible. So uh, what's to be done with those more rare or obscure texts? Um, you know, each one needs to be saved and documented. And so that's, um, what I would like to talk about now. So let's move on to um, discussing uh, the 
preservation efforts of, of one uh, person and his organization and the uh, network of people in the, the Tibetan community and abroad that, that he works with. I'm talking now of E. Gene Smith. Uh, Gene Smith is the founder of the, the organization that I work for, the Buddhist Digital Resource Center. His dates were 1938 to uh, 2010. Sadly, he passed away um, 11 years ago. Um, and uh, so Gene, long story short, um, moved, uh, had a peripatetic uh, college uh, career, uh, ended up at the uh, University of Washington at Seattle in the late 50s, um, 1959. This was uh, just as the first wave of Tibetan refugees were reaching uh, exile in India. At that time, uh, uh, many organizations were, were very concerned about um, the plight of the Tibetans and also interested in the uh, Cold War relevance of uh, uh, many elites in the Tibetan community. And so uh, some ranking lamas and aristocrats were brought to the states to teach and consult. And one of the uh, centers of learning that uh, had a uh, a cohort of, of Tibetan scholars and aristocrats was Gene's school, coincidentally, at uh, University of Washington at Seattle. Um, fortunately, Washington, uh, University of Washington um, was graced not only by some uh, high-ranking Tibetan nobles, but also by one of the great lamas of the first half of the 20th century, Daishin Rinpoche. If you'd like to learn more about him, there's an entire biography devoted to Daishin Rinpoche. Jean um, lived with uh, Daishin Rinpoche's family for five years from uh, 1960 to 1964, uh, essentially sat at his feet every day and received um, you know, a really remarkable and probably irreplaceable education about um, the entire history of, of Tibetan Buddhist literature, the who's who of uh, Tibetan history, and uh, additionally, uh, Daishin Rinpoche also informed Jean about all of the major libraries, archives, and important collections uh, in, the, in 20th century Tibet, letting him know that um, perhaps many of these books will be brought out of Tibet by other refugees and that um, Jean should you know, seek them out, see if they can be preserved. He also uh, told Jean about important um, books that might already be extant or available in European libraries. And so with a hand list of, of important books, Gene got a grant to go um, and survey the Tibetan collections of uh, several libraries in, in Europe to see if maybe they had an important text that he uh, could microfilm and bring back and then disseminate to, to other Tibetans and, and to the West more, more generally. Um, Gene, then uh, moved to India in 1965 and stayed there for 20 years, eventually joining the Library of Congress in 1968. Um, and so Gene was in India. He um, was you know, so lucky in that he w was able to meet with you know, many luminaries from uh, 20th century Tibetan religion, great lamas from all of the major uh, sectarian traditions, including the Bunpo. And he worked at the Library of Congress, which um, you know, gave him a nice perch from which to do his studies and, and maybe assist uh, the Tibetans in, in some way. Um, but he didn't just rest on his laurels or maybe gather texts and use them for his own research. Instead, he um, jettisoned his, his PhD program and decided not to simply compile a, a small um, but really important library for himself, go off and write a dissertation and, and then get a, a cushy job, but um, rather like a bodhisattva, if I may say that, um, he made a lot of personal sacrifices and um, you know, dreamt up some really ingenious, uh, skillful methods to um, benefit the Tibetan uh, textual tradition, which was just arriving in India at this time and was not well suited to 
the wet and warm climate of India. Tibetan texts in a Tibetan climate, very high up on the plateau, uh, will last for hundreds of years if uh, you know, they're not beset by a fire or flood or pests. Not so in India. All right, so we're talking the mid 60s in Delhi. How is it that he was going to be able to, one, technologically um, preserve uh, a large number of texts? And then how was it going to be financed? Well, um, Gene you know, knew that this was a problem, but he, um, you know, being, being such a genius and having such a big heart, figured out um, a method that had never been tried before, but ended up being very successful. Um, so uh, the United States uh, in the post, well, post Second World War period ran um, a debt relief program called PL480, Public Law 480, um, commonly known as Food for Peace. And uh, so there were funds available for uh, India, in this case, to repay debts to the United States in kind. So not with, with money, but with um, products and commodities that um, were needed or of interest by the United States. And um, one of the ways that India was fulfilling its, uh, its obligations, debt obligations, was by providing books in South Asian languages to the Library of Congress and over 20 major uh, public research institutions in the United States. All right. But the program was for books, newly published books in South Asian languages. All right, well, Jean had no shortage of one of a kind Tibetan manuscripts, at, but not books, you know, recently published books that the Library of Congress could acquire. And Jean didn't want the Tibetans to lose their books. He wasn't um, trying to find a way for the Library of Congress or, say, the Smithsonian to buy rare manuscripts from the Tibetans. That would have completely defeated the purpose of trying to. Uh, help the Tibetans keep their tradition alive. So, um, long story short, he um, you know, got on a rickshaw, went to various uh, printing houses in, in Delhi uh, with a couple of Tibetan manuscripts in tow and said, can these be reproduced? What you know, kinds of technologies would, you know, are, would make this possible? This is way before the days of the Xerox machine. Um, and so, he figured something out, all right, good. Um, you know, was able to check off the first box on this to-do list. Is it even possible to make duplicate copies? So that was the case. Then he had to go to the Library of Congress, his employer, and say, um, can you reclassify Tibetan as um, a language that falls under the, the PL480 category? Yes. Um, all right, and then can you budget some money to buy Tibetan books? Yes. Um, and so then he had to go back to the publishers and say, all right, I've got a customer, the Library of Congress. They're willing to buy 25 copies of everything that we publish. And there's thousands of volumes that I would like to see published. Um, he said, but printers, um, I'll, I'll give you my business on uh, one condition. I want you to print 100 copies of every book. The Library of Congress is going to buy 25, but I want 100 published. The remaining 75, you have to sell to the Tibetans at cost because the Library of Congress is willing or is able to pay um, uh, a rate that would pay off you know, the entire expenses. Um, and so they agreed to that. And then uh, after that, Gene you know, went out and uh, was able to gain the trust of many lamas who had their, their precious books with them. Uh, they were lent to Jean, published, you know, promptly returned. Um, and then Jean uh, from the Library of Congress wrote introductions to each of the books because uh, one way that the books could be classified as new publications is that they had uh, the apparatus of a, of a modern book, a title page, a, a brief introduction, table of contents, and so forth. And only Jean was qualified to do that at the, the LOC. Um, and so Jean. Um, was the, the one who got this started, but he uh, essentially turned over this new economy to the Tibetans who were you know, more than capable of managing it on their own. 
and uh, 15 or 15,000 or more volumes were published um, in India during this time. Uh, and so the books were not only distributed widely to the monasteries that were being rebuilt in the 70s and 80s and 90s in Nepal, Bhutan, uh, India, and elsewhere. Um, but uh, the books also then were sent to uh, you know, major libraries in the United States, and uh, this, these volumes became the basis for um, modern uh, Tibetan studies in the United States. It's quite a, a heroic deed. And so um, our mutual patron, Zongsar Kensei Rinpoche, um, founder and leader of, of Kensei Foundation, uh, had this to say about Gene Smith recently. We, we asked him for a testimony for publication. He said, it's hard to express or even fathom Gene's direct and indirect contribution to Tibetan Buddhism through the preservation and publication of so many of these rare texts. Let's just say that if a Tibetan native had done even a, a small fraction of what Gene Smith did for Tibetan Buddhism, he would almost certainly be considered a renowned Tulku or reincarnated Lama. Kensei Rinpoche goes on to say, at a personal level, um, I must admit that many of my current endeavors in Kensei Foundation and 84,000 owe so much to Gene for his guidance and inspiration. We cannot forget Gene Smith. All right, so let's fast forward um, to the founding of the Tibetan Buddhist Resource Center. So I mentioned that Gene was in India for 20 years from 1965 to 1985. Um, so he's an incredible Tibetan scholar and humanitarian, but he was also a civil servant. And so uh, he served as the um, station chief of the Library of Congress Delhi office for many years, and then was sent to Jakarta to be the station chief um, of the Library of Congress there. Um, which I think is the Library of Congress office for, for all of Southeast Asia. Um, served there for nine years. Once I, I went with Gene to uh, lunch at an Indonesian restaurant in New York City, one that had recently opened up and he ordered food in, in Indonesia and the waitresses were, were very surprised uh, about that. And um, he told me that his favorite dish was duck soup with marijuana leaves. Um, but they, it, that wasn't on the menu that day. But at any rate, uh, and then after uh, nine years in uh, Jakarta, he spent four years in Cairo as the station chief of the Library of Congress in, in Cairo, Egypt. In the late 90s, he took an early retirement and returned to the United States, a place he really hadn't lived in um, since the Eisenhower era. Um, and in 1999, with the assistance of um, some helpful friends who are still very much involved in this work, he founded a nonprofit that would um, allow him to figure out how he could take his voluminous library and all of the knowledge that he had both in his head and in his notebooks and somehow um, use it to benefit the tradition and benefit scholars in new ways. So um, you'll recall that in the mid 60s, Gene was uh, very innovative in using the technology of the day to um, massively reproduce texts. Um, in the late 90s, he looked around and said, all right, I wanna do something similar all over again. But what, what is the technology of the day? Well, it was the internet and prosumer uh, scanning machines. He thought, oh, you know, let me try to make use of the internet and, and you know, scanning machines and other means of digitizing images to basically have a PL480 2.0. The first PL480 was analog and those books were printed um, on paper that was not archival quality. Right, and so printed in 1965, now we're talking about the turn of the 21st century. Some of these um, earliest books that were reprinted um, as part of the original PL-480 um, 
Grant were, were starting to decompose, not visibly, but they weren't gonna last very much longer. So Gene knew that um, you know, he had to act, ironically, to um, reproduce the, the reproductions, but why not? He's a man of, of great vision and, and energy. So PL480 2.0. Um, TBR, so the organization and for the first 15 years of its existence was called TBRC, Tibetan Buddhist Resource Center. Um, the website, the very first generation of it, maybe this is the second generation, looked like this. Uh, it didn't used to, it hasn't always had um, a text viewer. It used to be just a database. Um, and so, um, I should acknowledge and, and express my, my gratitude towards um, the supporters who um, you know, offered such crucial uh, financial and, and moral support to TBRC and to Gene. This includes the Kensei Foundation. Um, TBRC was founded in 1999. The Kensei Foundation was founded in, I should know this, either two, in 2000. Yes, this is their 21st anniversary, 2000. So just the year after us, and TBRC um, was one of its first grantees and, and remains a, a you know, major beneficiary of their, their generosity. Um, in fact, uh, not only did Kensei Rinpoche himself you know, offer Gene a lot of guidance and, and support, but uh, Ken Jolie Che, the executive director of Kensei Foundation, was on our board for, for many years. The Rubin family of the Rubin uh, Museum of Art uh, provided crucial support for, for many years, as did the Peter and Patricia Gruber uh, Foundation. Um, and Patricia Gruber continues to be a, a friend of, of PDRC and, and myself. All right, so TBRC um, was uh, hugely revolutionary. And I know that when you say revolutionary, you don't need a, a an additional adjective like that, but uh, it completely changed the field. Um, why, you know, I was already interested in Tibetan Buddhism when I started graduate school, but why did I stay with Tibetan Buddhism? Um, I think one reason is that there were so many texts available at my fingertips because of TBRC. Um, again, you know, just as I said, I didn't want to make comparisons about, um, you know, the relative numbers of uh, manuscripts in Buddhist communities compared to, say, what you might find um, in the Arab world. Um, I also don't want to say that, you know, other religious, uh, other, you know, the, the study of, of uh, other religious traditions don't have something like a, a TBRC or a BDRC, but I think that uh, BDRC is, is pretty unique and remarkable in making tens of thousands of volumes of texts available you know, for free online, uh, open access for download 24-7 from around the world, um, and, and the images of the text are accompanied by a really um, special and insightful online catalog. Um, so, I mean, why not stick with Tibetan Buddhism? I had, you know, so many unpublished, rare, and special manuscripts just being, you know, shared with me, and, and so much of the content of the text was already explained in the, in the catalog. So um, I believe that one reason for the large number of um, Tibet, students of Tibetan Buddhism within um, the Buddhist studies field, in, in North America at least, is because of the embarrassment of riches of texts that um, is due be to the, um, the Tibetan care and um, care and preservation of the manuscripts over the centuries, and especially over the last century, but also because of what uh, BDRC has been able to accomplish in collaboration with, with the Tibetan community. All right, so Gene passed away in 2010. Let me speed up here. And uh, the organization continued along, uh, again, thanks to the support of our, our supporters, some of whom I've, I've mentioned before, but there are so many others. Um, and then in 2015, we um, went through a strategic rethink, to put it mildly. Um, and our strategic rethink was um, instigated 
if I can say, by the, by the Kent State Foundation. Um, we were, you know, nudged a little bit with the, the prompt that it appears as if the original mission had been fulfilled. Gene's library had been cataloged, you know, more Tibetan texts than, than the next 10 generations of PhD students were online. Okay, so what's next? You know, was TBRC just going to continue making incremental um, additions to its Tibetan library? Maybe should it just go on autopilot, sort of wind down, or should it think about offering the TBRC treatment to other Buddhist textual traditions? Um, and so the Ho Foundation, through the ACLS, sponsored a um, roundtable discussion at UC Berkeley in 2015 with uh, leading scholars from um, Chinese Buddhism, Southeast Asian Buddhism, and elsewhere. Uh, Sanskrit manuscripts um, included at, at UC Berkeley, and, and they were asked this question. Um, are there other uh, fields of Buddhist studies that would benefit from uh, what I'm calling the TBRC treatment? And the answer was a resounding yes. And so then the board expanded the mission, saying that uh, TBRC would, would henceforth be interested in preserving manuscripts from across Buddhist Asia, but in particular, it would focus on the manuscripts of um, cultures whose traditions are endangered. Uh, and so you'll see that um, for us, that means focusing on uh, manuscript traditions in certain Southeast Asian countries. Um, well, if TBRC was uh, about to move into um, the preservation of Burmese manuscripts and Cambodian manuscripts, we probably shouldn't uh, keep our same old name. So we also changed our name at that time to Buddhist Digital Resource Center. Um, I hope I've clarified sort of the, the history of that. I don't know that it was so well explained online um, when it happened. And actually, the resource didn't change overnight either. So it seemed to some at, in 2016, 17, as if the name change was merely cosmetic. It wasn't. There was a lot going on under the surface in terms of really implementing this expanded mission. Um, all right, so what I want to talk about um, now in the next you know, six or seven minutes before we wind down is about our digitization projects outside of um, the Tibetan cultural sphere and also the new website that we created in order to accommodate materials um, that, uh, you know, are, that need to be encoded in non-Tibetan languages. The, the TBRC website was not um, up to the task of dealing with manuscripts from, from other languages. So we've made uh, two parallel changes since 2015. New digitization projects and entirely new website. The new website is launching very soon and I'll, I'll give a demo of it, or at least a brief introduction right now. All right, so new preservation projects. Um, when the group met in 2015 to discuss an expanded mission, um, they, when, when the scholars agreed that yes, we should go ahead and, and um, move into new fields, uh, the scholars were asked, all right, what are the low hanging fruits? Or maybe to put it another way, um, which archives are of the highest priority to scholars? And uh, one of the two archives that everybody agreed upon should be our, our first targets was the Fragile Palm Leaf um, Foundation Palm Leaves, I'm sorry, I left out the S. Fragile Palm Leaves Foundation in Bangkok. And this is a, a massive uh, personal library of um, over 20,000 bundles and, and fascicles of Southeast Asian manuscripts and various media um, gathered over the decades by Peter Skilling, Dr. Peter Skilling, um, who, um, and I mean this with all due respect, is in many ways a, a Gene Smith for Southeast Asian manuscripts. Um, and now he has a massive library, um, many formats of text, but also um, many languages too. Uh, probably at least 10 different languages are represented in his manuscript um, tradition. Well, we can't you know, uh, dive off the deep end. So we um, looked more you know, closely at, at the collection and decided to 
work on the single largest segment of text that he has. And these are manuscripts in Burmese script. So um, Burmese script, but um, both Pali, Burmese vernacular and mixed Pali um, Burmese are represented in these um, manuscripts. There's 11,000 of them. So the Kensei Foundation um, is the funder for the project. And uh, it's been going on four years now. And we have 5,400 volumes already online. So we've completed uh, slightly over 50% of the project. Um, many of the manuscripts need to be cleaned, oiled, re-inked before they are legible again. So not only do we have a staff of people who do the digital photography of the text, but we also have a number of workers that have to treat each and every folia. Um, Professor Christian Lamertz of Rutgers University, uh, the leading scholar of uh, Burmese Buddhist manuscripts in the United States, um, recently uh, made this um, testimony about the, the project. BDRC's digital archive of the fragile palm leaves collection heralds a revolutionary contribution to Buddhist studies. It is the world's largest online repository of Pali and Burmese Buddhist manuscripts, preserving access to these endangered texts through critically significant textual and codicological traditions for generations of scholars to come. I think there's a little delay. Okay, the next major project is the um, Khmer Manuscript Digitization Project in Cambodia. Um, this project um, is centered in Phnom Penh, uh, but the majority of the manuscripts that we have digitized have been borrowed from um, monasteries in the countryside and, and in rural areas. Um, and so the scanning wound down in June of this year, this summer, um, uh, partially because uh, the pandemic just made working um, unsafe, both in, in our work site and it also became you know, very un, or very irresponsible for our staff based in Phnom Penh to continue traveling out into the countryside to borrow or return texts. Um, so the digitization work um, has more or less ceased. You'll remember that um, tr I cited uh, a statistic by Trent Walker, or at least a, a sort of um, estimate that 98% of the Cambodian manuscript tradition had been destroyed between 1970 and the, and the, in the 1990s. Um, and uh, so we have no reason to doubt that at least 90% were destroyed. I think we can be quite certain of that. Well, we were able to um, digitally capture 709,000 folios um, and to um, digitize 1,000, uh, I mean, sorry, 158,000 frames of previously filmed texts. So we estimate that the final page count of this project uh, will approximate 2.18 million individual pages. Um, and so 2 million page sides. So that's, you know, seven, we digitized 709,000 um, folia, front and back. So you double that ourselves, plus uh, we digitized a huge collection of uh, previously filmed texts, many of which are the originals are, are no longer extant. Um, two million pages, uh, page size, and that represents you know, less than 2% of what used to um, you know, be found and present in, in Khmer and Cambodian communities. So um, we're, we're really proud of the, the work that we did and our, our donors um, are, are also you know, so pleased with the, the work. Uh, I'll mention that uh, this work was uh, fully supported by a new foundation in the Bay Area called a Khmer Buddhist Foundation, AKBF. Um, and uh, one of the outputs of the project is not only the um, digitization of all these manuscripts, but a localized website in Khmer um, that has been created with um, you know, Cambodian user interface 
in mind. Uh, so not only is, is the interface um, you know, in the Khmer language, but um, we also have created a, a search interface that um, is going to be intuitive to um, contemporary uh, Cambodians who, who know the traditional language and, um, and the, the textual tradition to, to some degree. So we're going to create a localized website that will be separate from, from BDRC. So it'll be very, very welcoming to um, Cambodians and Khmer readers in, in Southeast Asia and in the diaspora as well. Um, all right, and we here, this is again at our work site. One moment, there's a little delay. All right, we also have a, a large scale project um, ongoing at the National Library of Mongolia. And this, these are uh, texts at the, the National Library of Mongolia, but um, they're in the Tibetan um, language. Uh, many of these texts, though, are, are written by Mongolians and are um, not well known in the broader uh, Tibetan world. Okay, here's the, the first page. Um, so this is our um, main digitization work site. As you can see, we um, use you know, the highest quality lighting and, and digital cameras. And then the image processing that takes place after um, the images are captured is, is also really good. Um, in addition to the way that we treat the, uh, the text to the highest archival standards, we also catalog them by BDRC's uh, four um, in-house expert Tibetan librarians. So um, the National Library of Mongolia has approximately 40,000 individual volumes of Tibetan language texts. In addition to their uh, Mongolian language texts, Chinese language texts, so we're, uh, but we're only focusing on the, the Tibetan language, 40,000 volumes. Now, um, when the project started three years ago, many of the texts, and by many, you know, we can extrapolate from that to thousands, were still in the, essentially the um, condition that they were in when they were brought to the National Library of Mongolia during the Soviet period, decades ago. As you see here, just bundled up, wrapped up together, and, you know, put lovingly, um, you know, in the, in the warehouse, but otherwise still just sort of sitting there. Um, and, you know, mold has been a problem. Um, it's not uh, devastating, but, you know, as you can imagine, these are now safe from rain and fire and, and Soviet purges, but still, um, this is not ideal. So I put these two uh, images side by side as, as a sort of before and after. Before, they were unwrapped, cataloged, preserved for posterity, put online, and given new dongdar, these new labels, and um, put on the shelves. Such a, uh, a gift to um, Mongolian Buddhism and uh, the Tibetan cultural world um, more broadly, Tibetan Buddhist cultural world. And the chief sponsor of uh, BDRC's National Library of Mongolia project is the Kensei Foundation as well. So, I mean, as you can see, it, it's wonderful to be um, talking about this at a Kensei supported event because none of it would have been possible without them. I'm not here just bragging about what BDRC was able to do because it had all these great ideas. No, without our, our, our Jindaks, our Ganapati, um, none of this uh, would have been been possible, so we're, we're so appreciative and grateful. Um, now, moving on, it just if you'll give me three minutes, uh, BDRC has a new website, the Buddhist Digital Archives, um, and the acronym that we use is Buddha. So think capital B, lowercase u, for Bu, Buddhist, and then Digital Archives, D-A. Um, this work was supported by the Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation of Hong Kong another very generous supporter of um, the academic study of Buddhism in uh, Europe and North America. So our new website is um, Buddha. It's, it's been live for many months now. You can find it at uh, www.bdrc.io.io, means input, output. 
Um, and this is the logo that we have for Buddha. So there's so much to say about it, but let me now bring this all back to Indra's net. So the, the new website has a better image viewer. It has a really great e-text interface. Um, it's fast and smooth. Um, so there's lots to say about it. But for now, um, let's just focus on the fact that it is a connected platform. And you see that um, represented um, in our logo, the logo that represents Buddha. Now, one reason we uh, have given the new web platform a name that is distinct from BDRC, we're not just calling it BDRC's new website, is that we um, conceive of it as an open collaborative platform that is managed, you know, it's, it's decentralized, um, but it's loosely managed by BDRC because someone has to take care of the data, but um, ultimately it's, uh, it's collaborative and growing and it's open for people to either contribute to or to um, fork off and utilize in their own ways. All of the code is available on GitHub if, if you want to look at it. But for now, um, with the theme of Indra's Net, I'll just say that uh, one of the most prominent aspects of Buddha, which you might not know about if you didn't hear about it, say for me, is that it's built using um, a new standards-based technology called linked open data. And linked open data is uh, being adopted uh, more and more by museums, libraries, universities, et cetera, so that they can share their resources. So linked data, just in a nutshell, is data that has been um, processed using a shared vocabulary or a shared ontology. So what it means is that um, institutions that want to um, have linked data according to a, a certain discipline or, or type of, of work will, will try to conform to shared standards so that one database will recognize the data in another database um, so that they can be mixed and matched and reused and repurposed um, according to um, the needs uh, of individual um, institutions or organizations. So in the case of BDRC, what this means is that um, BDRC not only has a new website that is um, better for Tibetan studies and that allows us to feature our Cambodian works and our Burmese works, but it also allows us to draw from the vast Buddhist holdings at the British Library, at the you know, Leiden University um, Library, at the Internet Archive, Cambridge University Digital Library, and others. There are many um, you know, important Buddhist manuscript collections in Europe. A lot of them are being digitized, and, and many of the libraries that are digitizing them follow the linked open data standards. So now, BDRC's library not only has more Tibetan texts than before um, because of projects like the Mongolia Project, but it has more than ever before because in addition to the works that we ourselves have digitized around the world, we're also able to offer you direct access to Tibetan texts from important collections. Um, the Waddell collection, the Von Manen collection, um, and, and the Dunhuang collections and so forth through linked data. So now, you know, when you're doing research, you don't have to remind yourself, oh, what are all the major libraries and what are the URLs for their, um, for their resources? And now I have to go check them one by one. Um, you don't. The uh, Buddha is a one-stop shop. It's a federated search engine that allows you to search simultaneously across multiple, um, multiple resources and databases. Um, and not only search and find, but we have an image viewer that will display texts from other people's libraries seamlessly right in our own viewer. So here are some texts, it's a Sanskrit manuscript from the Internet Archive. You can see we, we give them full attribution there um, in the lower right hand corner. Um, the images are on their servers, they get the web traffic, but BDRC's users are the, the beneficiaries. 
of the resource. You know, you might not think to go on Internet Archive to find um, rare manuscripts from the Hodgson collection. Hodgson, you know, the, the 18th century British uh, colonial officer who went to Nepal and, and gathered together all the, the important Sanskrit manuscripts studied by Bernouf and others. Well, they've been digitized by Internet Archive. Um, prior to EDRC, they were only available on Internet Archive, not a place that maybe a lot of Buddhist uh, researchers think about going to. But um, now we are doing them a favor by amplifying their data using linked data. So um, just briefly, some of our connections through linked data, um, Hodgson Collection, Waddell, NGMPP, NGMCP, Von Manen, EAP, Internet, uh, uh, the Endangered Archives Program of British Library, 84,000, Wikidata, CUDL is uh, Cambridge University Digital Library, and others. All right, now, linked data is a two-way street. So not only does BDRC harvest data um, from other collections, and we don't harvest it in any kind of greedy way. Um, like I said, it's just a link. They get the web traffic, um, and it amplifies their data. And we always give full attribution to the providers of the, of the content. Um, and whenever we link to a text, there's a very easy, there's a button that will allow you to go directly to the provider's website. It's also a two-way street, as it should be, and as we always intended it to be. BDRC's data can also be easily and freely um, included within the websites and databases of other traditions. And so we have a program now that allows monasteries, uh, Tibetan monasteries for now, um, to create within their own self-managed websites um, pages that allow them to populate the, the curriculum that they study um, for easy access. So this is our kind of pilot program at the Zongsar Kensei Chukhi Lodra Institute in Beer, India. We asked them for their curriculum, went and found all the relevant texts on BDRC, and created this uh, interface for them. The code is, is free. Any, anybody can use it. You can put it on your own personal website if you want. And you just you know, um, paste in the, the links to the, TB, the BDRC reference um, resource, and it, it'll appear online for free whenever you want, however you want, um, as much or as little. All of, you know, all of the canons, just a few pages. Um, it's very flexible. Now, this is what I mean by Indra's net. So for those of you that, that um, are new to this image, Indra Jala or Indra's net, um, it's a multifaceted surface. Uh, well, so rather it's a net um, and at each node is a jewel, multifaceted jewel, and each side of the jewel um, is able to reflect every other jewel. Um, and it's, a, it's an image from India that's used in uh, one important Buddha Sutra. It says here is the multifaceted surface of each jewel reflects all other jewels in the net. Each of the uh, reflected jewels also contains the reflections of all other jewels. Thus, there is an unending process of infinite reflections. So um, we're hoping that through um, modern technologies like linked data and also by um, you know, being quite proactive about going out and trying to um, help digitally preserve manuscripts and put them online that we can create, um, you know, uh, or we can help create and foster a um, digital resource that is something like an Indra's net, both for um, Buddhist communities and the Buddhist studies community and all of the many intersections be between them. There's more I could say, but I think that I'll just um, end it with my vision for the future, real quick, two minutes. So connecting Buddhist literature with the world is our new motto. In 2015, we took on a new name, but also um, a, and, oh, rather, we took on a new name, BDRC. Then in 2019, we um, decided to um, have a, to you know, change our motto to one that, um, is more reflective of what we're doing now and what we um, you know, aspire to in the future. And so we um, 
decided on connecting Buddhist literature with the world. And I like to say that this has two parts to it. One is just the first three words, connecting Buddhist literature. We're trying to connect all Buddhist literature um, uh, by creating one ontology and database that can handle all the various language and textual traditions. But then we also want to take this Buddhist literature and connect it with the world broadly. And so this is what I would uh, like to see over the next 10 years, say, at, at BDRC. So um, I'm you know, very happy to announce that BDRC has been gifted use of a large office space in downtown Boston. It's huge, 7,700 square feet. It's massive. It's larger than we um, have an immediate need for, but how great to have this you know, open space that you know, will slowly start to fill and, and utilize in, in new and engaging and innovative ways. Um, the, the patron of this space is the, the Karmapa. We're very, very grateful for, for that. Um, and so what would I like to see at the new space and what do I hope will happen, you know, if we all sort of work together, an annual Gene Smith Memorial Lecture, that would certainly be wonderful. Um, you know, hey, let's have translation fellows in residence at BDRC. Um, what a great place to come and do um, a translation intensive. You have all the text, TBRC's, BDRC's librarians, um, I don't know why I call it. TBRC, BDRC's <laughs> librarians are breaking my, my own cardinal rule. Um, and then, of course, you know, we're now in a position to offer training and support for local preservation efforts because we, we have experience now working in, in various um, conditions and with different types of Buddhist texts, um, paper manuscripts and palm leaf manuscripts. So um, it's time that we start to produce materials, say um, short videos and, and written guides uh, in various languages. Um, we wanna do workshops on uh, research technology and preservation, um, you know, both at the new office and online, we um, aspire to offer uh, courses on Buddhist culture and thought for the interested public. And we, want to extend the archive into classrooms by creating pedagogical materials for um, all different types of learning environments, high school, um, world history, intro to um, Khmer language, intro to Tibetan language for Buddhist studies courses, for classes on uh, global book history and so forth. Um, there's a lot that, that we can contribute to those kinds of efforts. Um, so that's another area we want to move into. Um, and so we also, um, because our, of the large office space we have and its location just outside of, of Boston's Chinatown, we want to open our doors to local Buddhist and Asian and Asian American communities for the programming. It just so happened that um, this morning when I wrote out this list, it happened to be in this angular form. That was not planned at all. I did not move things around or count syllables or add extra words. It just happened. So I don't know. Maybe that's a good sign that it, it, it will be. But um, that's all I think we have time for today. Thank you so much for your patience. And if you want to get in touch with me, please, jan at bdrc.io.